Okay, so this is your review for your next exam, which will be on microbial metabolism. So let's start by looking at the pathway that you are probably already familiar with from your basic biology courses or your high school biology courses. <clears throat> this pathway is called cellular respiration. Cellular respiration is a metabolic pathway that breaks down glucose to produce ATP. The stages of cellular respiration include these three stages, which are glycolysis, the citric acid cycle, otherwise known as the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain, otherwise known as oxidative phosphorylation. The electron transport chain, otherwise known as oxidative phosphorylation, generates much more ATP than is generated in glycolysis or in the citric acid cycle or Krebs cycle. The electron transport chain is powered by the movement of electrons through the electron transport chain, which is a series of proteins that are embedded um, either in the inner membrane of the prokaryote or in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. And these electrons uh, come originally from the glucose molecule, which is broken down in glycolysis. These electrons are shuttled to the electron transport chain using electron carriers such as um, NADH and FADH2. So how do we define cellular respiration? So uh, cellular respiration, um, uh, respiration takes place when any organic compound, which is usually a carbohydrate, is oxidized completely, usually to carbon dioxide and water. Now, when we say oxidized, what we really are meaning is that we're meaning that that molecule is being broken down by uh, breaking its bonds and removing the individual um, electrons from the molecule itself. So let's look at different types of, uh, we'll look at different types of cellular respiration and, and we'll show examples of different types of bacteria in this presentation and we'll look at a bunch of different pathways um, as well as um, um, some different peripheral ideas such as enzyme function. Okay. So this is literally the easiest um, um, diagram you will ever see to explain cellular respiration, and I'm very proud of it. <clears throat> so cellular respiration in the, in the uh, most concise nutshell that I could think of is literally this. Um, the process of cellular respiration is that you will take one glucose molecule, molecule and um, you will break it down or completely oxidize the molecule and uh, produce ATP in the process. And the outcome is you will get ATP and you will also create water and carbon dioxide. All right, so let's begin to look at this in a little bit more detail. All right, so we begin cellular respiration with the process of glycolysis. Okay. Um, now, glycolysis is common to both aerobic and anaerobic uh, pathways, <clears throat> and we'll talk about those anaerobic pathways later. In glycolysis, uh, ATP is generated by what is called substrate level phosphorylation. Okay, so let me say that again. In glycolysis, ATP is generated by substrate level phosphorylation. Uh, in contrast, uh, just to just to bring that out, um, in uh, the electron transport chain, ATP will be created through oxidative phosphorylation. So that is uh, the contrast there. Okay. So in glycolysis, ATP is generated by substrate level phosphorylation. Substrate level phosphorylation is the production of ATP by transferring high energy phosphate groups from an organic molecule to ADP. Glycolysis is, is an anaerobic process, so we do not need oxygen in order to undergo glycolysis. Um, 
two ATP are actually invested um, at the beginning of the glycolysis uh, process. And we call this the energy investment phase here at the beginning. So two ATP are actually used or are invested at the beginning of glycolysis in order to split the glucose molecule. So the uh, six uh, carbon, um, the six carbon atoms that make up glucose are split into two individual um, um, two individual molecules that are made up of three carbon atoms each. There's also some other atoms there too that I've omitted just for um, simplicity. <clears throat> All right. So the two ATP are used to split the glucose molecule in the uh, energy investment phase, and the first product that we get from splitting is actually called uh, um, glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate or G3. Uh, G 3P, or glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. And then from there, it will continue on and um, get converted into pyruvate, which I'll show you in the next slide here. So um, the after G3P, <clears throat> then we enter what's called the energy payoff phase of glycolysis. This is where we end up um, getting paid back with interest. So in the energy payoff phase, uh, redox transformations take place that lead to the generation of four ATP. Um, so we end up with a net gain of two ATP. So the final result from this stage is we gain two ATP and we also end up um, gaining um, uh, two of the electron carrier, which is uh, NADH. And we also end up with two pyruvate molecules from our glucose molecule. <clears throat> so we ended up uh, making our money back and more. Um, so you might remember from our first slide that we have three different uh, stages, if you will, of cellular respiration. The first one is glycolysis, glycolysis that we just discussed, and the next one is uh, the Krebs cycle. Between glycolysis and the Krebs cycle, there is a small uh, transition reaction that does take place. I have it magnified here, so it looks very large, but um, it's not considered a real uh, phase or stage, so it didn't really get a big block on that first slide. Um, <clears throat> so it's just simply called a transition reaction, but um, nonetheless, um, it is important and we should make note of it. So we will do that. All right, so here in this diagram, I have glucose in its very, very shortened form. So we just have glucose going to, I'm sorry, glycolysis in its shortened form going just to glucose to its final product of two pyruvate molecules. Those two pyruvate molecules during the transition reaction are actually going to be converted to two acetyl-CoA molecules. Now, if you look at uh, what comes out of the transition reaction, the transition reaction does not actually create any ATP, but it does create an electron carrier. It creates um, uh, NADH. So it creates NADH and also creates um, CO2. And it does that per pyruvate molecule. I didn't really make that clear on this, um, on this, and I probably should have. So let me just make that clear in my words here. So um, for each pyruvate molecule, you will generate one NADH and one carbon dioxide, which if I had kept the carbons on here would have made more sense. So pyruvate, so glucose is a six carbon uh, sugar Pyruvate is a three carbon molecule, okay? And you see here that we lose a carbon um, in the transition reaction. So we end up losing a carbon to carbon dioxide. So each pyruvate loses a carbon. So we end up uh, um, losing two carbon di dioxides and we um, uh, create two NADH in the transition reaction per one glucose molecule. Acetyl-CoA is also a two-carbon molecule. 
All right. <clears throat> so acetyl-CoA enters the Krebs cycle one molecule at a time. So one acetyl-CoA at a time enters the Krebs cycle, otherwise known as the TCA cycle or the citric acid cycle. All right. So here is my simplified diagram of the citric acid cycle or Krebs cycle. So here I have the two carbon acetyl-CoA uh, entering the Krebs cycle from the side. I could have chosen anywhere. I don't know why I chose the side, but I did. Um, so there you have it. So these totals are actually per one acetyl-CoA molecule. So, <clears throat> all right. So if I have one acetyl-CoA going, uh, going in here, and just, just remember that this acetyl-CoA actually keeps getting uh, regenerated during this process. So with one acetyl-CoA, I generate three NADH, which are electron carriers. Um, I generate uh, one FADH2, which is another electron carrier. I'm going to generate carbon dioxide, and then I'm going to generate an ATP or GTP. And GTP, just so you know, it's, it does the same job as ATP, um, but for our sake, we can just go ahead and stick to uh, ATP. All right. So each acetyl-CoA... <clears throat> um, uh, each acetyl-CoA molecule that enters the TCA uh, cycle, Krebs cycle, separately. So we'll get uh, uh, two ATP, uh, two FADH2, and six NADH per glucose molecule, per glucose molecule. And then carbon dioxide is produced as a, as a waste product. All right. So here is the summary of glycolysis and the transition step and the citric acid cycle per, <clears throat> uh, per glucose molecule. Okay, per glucose molecule. So for each glucose molecule that enters glycolysis followed by the citric acid cycle, if we add this up so we get, um, so remember, remember at the beginning of glycolysis, we use up eight, uh, two ATP, but we um, end up making four ATP. So we get a net gain of two ATP in glycolysis. We also make a two NADH during glycolysis. Um, during the transition reaction, we make no ATP, but we do create uh, two carbon dioxide molecules um, and two NADH molecules um, from one glucose molecule. Okay. <clears throat> one glucose molecule, we know that that is going to yield two pyruvates. Two pyruvates gives us two acetyl-CoAs. So um, the diagram here is giving us all the totals for the entire glucose molecule. Okay. So, um, so we'll get two in the citric acid cycle, we will get two carbon dioxides, two NADH, two more carbon dioxides, two more NADH, two more ATP, uh, two FADH2, which is another uh, electron carrier, and two more NADH. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so this is just another way to look at it. Um, so here, so this top part here in pink, this is glycolysis. Um, this blue middle part where it says acetyl-CoA is showing the transition reaction. And this circle at the bottom um, and it says two turns because they're just reiter reiterating that um, that this is showing the totals for what would be uh, the entire breakdown of one glucose molecule. Okay, so this is um, one glucose molecule's worth, if you will, of what you would get out of it. So this would be two turns of the citric acid cycle. Okay. So both acetyl-CoA's of the glucose molecule are being broken down. Okay. 
Okay, and these are all of our um, outcomes. So we have two ATP um, at the beginning of glucose getting used, um, four ATP coming out, so we have a net gain of two ATP. Um, we, have, um, we have our electron carrier here getting generated. We have another electron carrier here getting it generated in the transition step. We have some carbon dioxide, which is a waste product that we exhale from our bodies and doesn't do anything for us. <clears throat> in the citric acid cycle, we have two more ATP that are generated, and then we have quite a few in the citric acid cycle. Uh, we actually have quite a few additional NADH, and we have some FADH2 also, which are additional electron carriers that are generated. And then some more carbon dioxide, which we exhale as a waste product. So what is the purpose of all of these electron carriers? So these electron carriers are going to carry electrons, hence the name, and they carry their electrons to the electron transport chain. So what this is showing here in this last column with all of these stars here, this is showing what um, the ATP that will be the um, final outcome, <clears throat> um, the predicted outcome, for uh, the gain of ATP that those electrons, that these electron carriers that deliver to the electron transport chain will potentially produce in oxidative phosphorylation in the electron transport chain. Okay, <clears throat> so let me elaborate on that. All right, so oxidative phosphorylation is the process by which most of the ATP uh, molecules arise from cellular respiration. Uh, NADH and FADH2 provide uh, pairs of electrons for oxidative phosphorylation. Electrons are passed along a series of four protein complexes called cytochromes, and they're known um, as electron transport. The energy released is um, used to combine phosphate with ADP to form ATP. And up to 32 ATP are produced in that process. Okay, so let's take a moment to talk about location. Okay, so <clears throat> um, the location is going to vary depending on whether we are in a prokaryote, such as a bacteria or an archaea cell, um, or if we are in a eukaryotic cell. So location, location, location. So let's look at the three stages of cellular respiration and let me define where those, um, where those different stages take place. Okay. <clears throat> in a eukaryotic cell, Glycolysis um, is going to take place in the cytosol or in the cytoplasm. Just so you know, in um, prokaryotes, in the next slide, you'll notice that that is also the same. So eukaryotes and prokaryotes both, um, <clears throat> both have the location of glycolysis will take place in the cytoplasm. <clears throat> you could also say cytosol, which is just the intracellular fluid. That would also be correct. For the Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle, in eukaryotic cells, this will take place between the inner membrane and outer membrane of the mitochondria. Now, this area between the inner and outer membrane of mitochondria is called the peripheral space. The peripheral space. Um, <clears throat> then the final stage of cellular respiration called oxidative phosphorylation or the electron transport chain will take place in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. Versus looking at the prokaryotic cell, glycolysis will still take place in the cytoplasm just like in eukaryotic cells, but when we get to the Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle, that is going to take place in what is called the periplasmic space. The periplasmic space is the space between the cell wall and the cell membrane of the prokaryotic cell. Um, <clears throat> we also have oxidative phosphorylation and the electron transport chain that occurs in prokaryotic cells. And that is going to occur in the inner cell membrane 
of the prokaryotes. Okay, so prokaryotes do not have mitochondria. In a sense, you can kind of think of them as they are mitochondria. We um, believe that they probably um, um, that our mitochondria probably evolved from prokaryotic cells. So you can kind of think of it like that. All right. So electron transport chain or oxidative phosphorylation in eukaryotic cells. The electron transport chain is a series of proteins and molecules that are embedded in the cell membrane of prokaryotes or in the membrane of the mitochondria in eukaryotes. And what they do is they pass along electrons. So the eukaryotic electron transport chain exists in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. So here I have a blow up of the mitochondria. And um, here you can visualize the inner membrane of the mitochondria and the outer membrane of the mitochondria. And the electron transport chain in the prokaryote. And you can see here the uh, series of proteins and molecules are embedded in the membrane of the prokaryote. And they are passing along electrons. So prokaryotic electron transport chains exist in the cell membrane. Okay. So let me introduce the concept of chemiosmosis and electron transport. So as electrons move down the electron transport chain, protons are pumped across the membrane. This establishes a, a concentration gradient for the protons. The protons then, uh, then flow through the ATP synthase which is shown here, and, um, and it does this through what we call facilitated diffusion. So ATP synthase then harnesses the energy from the flowing protons, and it will use that energy to phosphorylate ADP into ATP. Oxygen is going to be the final or terminal electron acceptor in the electron transport chain. Um, it's going to, oxygen accepts those um, uh, electrons and it will become, uh, uh, it will actually become water. Okay. So, <clears throat> so let's zoom in so we can get a better, uh, a better look at what's going on here. All right, so this is the electron transport chain and we're zooming in. So the energy created by the electron transport chain is used to pump protons across the membrane. The buildup of the positive charge creates a proton motive force, which is the potential energy in the form of a proton gradient. Okay, so we're splitting up the positive and negative charges. So I'm gonna have this buildup of positive charge in the periplasmic space of our prokaryotic cell. Okay. <clears throat> that's going to be building up a proton motive force that can be used. The separation of charges that results is a potential energy. Uh, protons will experience a driving force that, that is uh, directing them um, to want to go from the area of high proton concentration to the area of low concentration. So during respiration, this proton motive force is used by the ATP synthase, which is the last structure here, to make ATP, the vital, ener uh, vital high energy molecule that supports growth and synthesis of all major cellular components. The ATP synthase opens a channel through the membrane and allows the protons to flow through down its own uh, electrochemical gradient or proton gradient. The energy then turns the ATP synthase resulting in a torque force. So it actually turns, physically turns the ATP like a little motor. Okay. And this torque force 
or turning force is used to add a phosphate group to ADP to generate ATP. The process of using an electron transport chain to generate a proton motive force used for ATP synthesis is referred to as oxidative phosphorylation. Okay, and um, since we're talking about um, oxidation reduction reactions on occasion, um, let me go ahead and give you my acronym to remember oxidation reduction reactions, otherwise known as redox reactions. <clears throat> so the easiest way to think of it is that Leo says ger. So what do I mean by Leo says ger? So Leo means loses electron, wait, Leo, loses electrons is oxidized, and ger is gains electrons is reduced. So Leo says ger, like Leo the lion. So uh, Leo is loses electrons, oxidizes, ger is gains electrons is reduced. So when we're talking about something being oxidized, just think about it as electrons are being removed. Okay. All right, so let's go a little bit deeper again into the electron transport chain. So um, layer by layer going a little bit deeper. Okay. So the electron transport chain again. So the first complex here, <clears throat> the first enzyme complex is a dehydrogenase. This dehydrogenase functions to remove hydrogen from NADH. Okay. Now, hydrogen has one proton and one electron. So when the hydrogens are removed in the electron transport chain, what is going to happen is the electron is... Um, Sorry, when hydrogens are removed in the electron transport chain, the hydrogen atom is split into its individual proton and electron. Those are the protons. And here in purple in, in this diagram, here in purple we have where the electrons are. So we can follow where the electrons are. So the electrons actually stay in that membrane as they're being passed from complex to complex. The protons are the ones that are actually being pumped across the, um, the membrane. <clears throat> okay, the electrons are passed through the membrane from complex to complex in the electron transport chain. The protons are pumped into the periplasmic space in, pro in prokaryotes. In eukaryotes, the protons are pumped into the peripheral space of the mitochondria. The passing of electrons down the electron transport chain generates energy, like electricity going through a copper wire, for example. The terminal oxidase is complex four, so that's the last one in line. It is a proton pump that transfers the electrons to oxygen. Okay, so oxygen is our final um, electron acceptor or our terminal electron acceptor which is why, if that is the case, that will be considered aerobic cellular respiration, meaning with oxygen. The energy created from the electron transport chain is used by complex four to pump even more protons into the periplasmic space for prokaryotes or peripheral space for eukaryotes. All right, so all of this, this uh, proton gradient, what is the point of it? <clears throat> so this results in a gradient of protons across the cell membrane, high on the outside, low on the inside. This proton gradient feeds the, uh, the next uh, metabolic model, um, or the next uh, um, figure, which is the ATP synthase, okay? So the ATP synthase is going to harness this uh, potential energy of the proton motive force. The protons build up in the, um, in the space, creating the proton gradient. 
<clears throat> which is a source of potential energy, since substances always want to move down their own concentration gradients, called the proton motive force. Okay. So, um, adenosine triphosphate is the real name of ATP, and here we see the structure of ATP. Okay. Um, so ATP is, I just noticed that says adenine, huh? Huh, interesting. So it's actually adenosine triphosphate. So it's adenosine triphosphate. And here we have three phosphate groups. Um, so ATP is actually made by two different mechanisms. Okay, so ATP is made by substrate level phosphorylation during glycolysis, which is the direct transfer of phosphate from one molecule to another. And in the electron transport chain, we have ATP being made by the process of, of oxidative phosphorylation. Oxidative phosphorylation uses the energy of the proton motive force. We call that the energy of chemiosmosis. Okay. So now that we have our foundation, let's go ahead and um, look at the much bigger view. So um, a lot of us go through our uh, high school biology years and beginning biology and think that, oh, well, that's all there is. All we do is just metabolize glucose and that's it. Au contraire. Um, so there's so, so, so much more out there. We are just going to barely scratch the surface in this course. Um, but um, hopefully, at least I'll be able to open your eyes to a lot of other, um, uh, at least other possibilities that are that are out there. It's so much more diverse than I can even begin to explain. So <clears throat> most microorganisms obtain their energy from nutrients that they take into the cell. For microorganisms, these nutrients may come from either organic um, or inorganic sources. Once the energy giving nutrients enter the cell, they must be chemically processed so that they can be used. They are of no use to the cell in their raw form. The chemical processing that takes place um, involves a series of chemical reactions called a metabolic pathway. Um, this metabolic pathway functions to trap some of the chemical energy in the form of ATP. Also, metabolic pathways will function to break down larger molecules into smaller molecules that can be used as building blocks for the synthesis of new cellular components. So living organisms must synthesize polymers of these important molecules in order to sustain life. This would be an example of anabolic reactions. Similarly, these molecules can be broken down to release energy or to use as building blocks for other molecules that the organisms uh, might need at the time. So these would be considered the catabolic reactions of metabolism. So when we talk about metabolism, metabolism is actually defined as all of the chemical reactions going on within the organism. And this includes everything that is being broken down as well as being built up. So um, this includes um, chemical reactions that are going to be synthesis reactions, which are um, building bonds and um, creating larger molecules out of smaller molecules or decomposition reactions where I'm taking larger molecules, breaking them down, breaking bonds so that I can get smaller uh, molecules. So um, when we talk about these building blocks, um, we get these building blocks from our, from our food. <clears throat> and what building blocks do we need? Um, well, we need four things, really. Um, uh, we need carbohydrates, we need proteins, and we need fats. 
and we also need nucleic acids. Um, but we don't get nucleic acids from our diet. We actually synthesize them in our bodies. Um, so, <clears throat> so metabolism is all of the chemical reactions taking place in an organism. And um, the anabolic reactions are going to build polymers from uh, small building blocks. And when we do that, those are called endergonic reactions. And the reason they're called endergonic reactions is because energy is required for those reactions. Okay, so endergonic means energy has to be put in. Catabolic reactions means that um, you're breaking down a polymer, okay, into you're taking a larger molecule, breaking it down into a smaller mo molecule. This would be an exergonic, um, an exergonic reaction. You're breaking a bond and energy is being released. So all life as we know it on planet Earth is carbon-based. Now, when you go to the grocery store and you see the sign that says um, organic, <laughs> you know, organic bread or organic vegetables, that means something very, very different than what it means in science. Now, um, when we talk about organic molecules, organic chemistry, it means something very, very different. So when we talk about something being organic, um, we're talking about it having a lot of carbon and hydrogens. Okay, so in other words, um, well, if it has just hydrogen and carbons, it's a hydrocarbon, like a fossil fuel, for example. Those are hydrocarbons. <clears throat> and why is it so, um, why are hydrocarbons so sought after? Well, because they have energy. Our energy sources, not only of our body, but of, of the world, um, we're getting better with, you know, utilizing alternative energy sources, but you know, when, when you look at history, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of fossil fuel use. So we've used um, hydrocarbons for a very, very long time as a source of energy. So, um, so you can, can kind of think of it as that's what uh, biological entities also do. Okay. So, um, so what is the big deal? Why carbon? what what's the big deal of carbon well carbon is very unique <clears throat> it is the only element capable of building um of building four strong covalent bonds with up to four different uh, atoms or molecules so if you do the math what this means is that there's more flexibility there's more arrangements there's more different things that you can make with with carbon or larger macromolecules that you can make long um you know long fatty acid chains um that you can make for example um large aromatic rings you know um um different configurations like we see with with diamonds for example i mean so there's just all sorts of um wonderful configurations that you can make with carbon that you just can't really make in a stable form with um, with other elements. Now, <clears throat> now um, you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, there are other things in that same group that, sorry, hold on a second. So you might be thinking that um, that there are other other elements in that same group and and anything in that group is going to be able to make four bonds and you're right however carbon is in um the how's that okay so the electron shell <clears throat> that is um because remember that it's only the electrons in the outer shell that can make bonds so as you continue down the periodic table the electrons available for bonding are going to be further and further away from that positively charged nucleus. What that means is even though we have other, um, other elements that can make four bonds, they will not be as strong because they're further away from the nucleus. So, um, so that's why 
it's unique. So you really have to say that not only is it able to make four bonds, but it makes four strong covalent bonds. And that is what makes it unique. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so um, surprisingly, about 96% um, of all of all living matter <laughs> um, is made up of just simply carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen. Um, and uh, sulfur and phosphorus come in at a very close second to these. So um, it's pretty amazing that we can get such a wide variety of our macromolecules and cellular components with uh, so few elements. <clears throat> so there are actually four principal groups of organic compounds um, that contribute to almost all of the structures of the cell. And those go back to, again, our carbohydrates, our nucleic acids, our proteins, and our lipids, once again. Um, so, um, so let me just give you some terminology. So when we are looking at our cellular, cellular components and a lot of these macromolecules inside of the body, <clears throat> we have a lot of these macromolecules are uh, polymers. Now, a polymer is a general term that just means that it's a large molecule that's made up of individual subunits that repeat. Okay. Now, the individual subunits that repeat are referred to generically as monomers. Okay. So let's take a carbohydrate for uh, as an example. Okay. If you have a carbohydrate, which is a sugar, um, if you have uh, just one single unit, we call that a monosaccharide or a simple sugar, right? So we have our monosaccharide. <clears throat> now, if we put two monosaccharides together, we get a disaccharide. Um, and, um, eventually if we get a bunch of them together, now we've got a polysaccharide. So our polysaccharides are going to be our polymers of saccharides of, or polymers of carbohydrates or sugar. These are our complex carbohydrates and starch would be an example of that. Um, nucleic acids make up our RNA and our DNA, for example, and, <clears throat> and nucleic acids um, uh, uh, come together through um, the formation of phosphodiester bonds to form those larger polymers. So the DNA molecule and the RNA molecule would be considered a polymer made up of nucleic acids, which are the individual monomers. Proteins, <clears throat> proteins are made up of individual monomers, which are the amino acids. Okay, so we have our amino acids, and then those individual amino acids will be able to come together and form uh, peptide bonds. And we've got proteins that come together. Um, I've got two of them. I've got a dipeptide. Um, if I have a small string of amino acids, that becomes a polypeptide. As that string gets very, very large, then it becomes uh, referred to as a protein. So a protein would be a polymer, a polypeptide would also be a polymer, and then the individual monomers would be the amino acids. Um, depending on the textbook you read, sometimes lipids are not considered monomers because the lipid molecule itself is not absolutely a repeating unit itself. Um, but nonetheless, um, I went ahead and used this, um, um, this that I found because it was just convenient. But we do break down our lipids into their individual components. Um, and we separate them from the head group and, and so on and so forth. Um, but they do make larger, uh, larger molecules that need to be synthesized or broken down. <clears throat> okay, so um, it's important to know what types of bonds form these uh, very important molecules that um, that we depend on. Our monosaccharides are joined via a glycosidic linkage 
or a glycosidic bond. Amino acids join via peptide bonds. Glycerol and fatty acids are joined, as hopefully you know from our last module. Um, they're joined uh, using ester linkages or ester bonds, um, except for in the archaea, which uses ether bonds instead. <clears throat> And this is true for phospholipids as well as the triglycerides. Nucleotides are joined together using the uh, phosphodiester bonds. Okay. Oh, I already gave you that one, so I'll skip that slide. <clears throat> All right. So um, if you look at how how these um, how these larger molecules are formed from their individual monomers. When the monomers come together, what you're actually going to do is you're, you're going to get a condensation reaction, um, and you can also call these um, a dehydration reaction. Um, and the reason you're going to call it a condensation or dehydration reaction is because you're going to get water. Oops. You're going to get water as a, oops, no, go back. You're going to get water as a byproduct here. So you're creating the bond. Um, this is also a type of a synthesis reaction. Anytime you have things joining together, you can call that a synthesis reaction as well. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So, um, so here are just some of the some of the things to keep in mind. So we've got proteins that need to be broken down into amino acids. Polysaccharides need to be broken down into individual monosaccharides in order to be continued um, to be catabolized further. Fats need to be um, catabolized into um, into the individual fatty acids and um, and glycerides. If we're building up molecules, we have to go, <clears throat> I'm sorry, if we're breaking down molecules, like I just said, we have to go, um, um, we have to go and break it down into, from its uh, polymer into its monomer, okay, and <clears throat> So you're probably, so the um, pathway that we were just discussing is actually right here kind of in the middle where it says stage two conversion of building blocks into acetyl-CoA. So um, that was actually where we took the monosaccharide. Now glucose is a monosaccharide. Okay, so glucose was here at the beginning of glycolysis. So glycolysis um, took glucose and converted that to pyruvate. After pyruvate, pyruvate was um, converted into acetyl-CoA, and then acetyl-CoA entered into the Krebs cycle. Now, that is the main pathway of your sugars, of your polysaccharides. <clears throat> now, um, now, what about proteins and lipids? Well, if you look at this diagram, you'll see that um, that their catabolic pathways are all going to eventually feed back in to that main pathway of cellular respiration that we discussed at the beginning of the video, which is very convenient and handy. Um, so this is the structure of the lipid. So the lipid is not um, not a true polymer like the other ones are. Um, it's important to keep in mind that lipids are always going to be nonpolar. They're always going to be hydrophobic. Okay? Um, they are um, uh, very important structures because they make up our phospholipids, of course. <clears throat> They are great for long-term energy storage. All right, so these are our fats, our oils. Um, they're also used as signaling molecules like steroids, for example. Most of our fats come in the form of triglycerides, and that's what this is here. So here you have your three fatty acids, okay? This is your triglycerides. <clears throat> and um, and this these... Uh, fatty acids are attached to a glyceride here at the top. Okay. So when 
you're breaking down a lipid, you have to um, um, you have to break this uh, molecule apart. So triglycerides are a form of long-term energy storage in animals and in um, uh, many prokaryotes as well. So they're made of glycerol or glyceride <clears throat> and three fatty acids. Okay. Now the fatty acids, if you look at the fatty acid, maybe this one's a little bit easier. Okay, so if you look at this fatty acid, and then you look at the phospholipid, hopefully you see that they're remarkably similar, at least the eukaryotic bacterial phospholipid. The difference is that um, instead of having a third fatty acid chain here, you're going to have a phosphate. So very, very um, similar, <clears throat> and they're both considered fats. So let's just talk about some anabolic reactions for a moment. <clears throat> let's talk about how do we build things when we when we need them. Um, so cells are always in need of repair. Cells are in need of replacement. So sometimes we sometimes we need to store energy long term. When we make ATP, ATP does not hang out forever. <clears throat> um, that. A uh, high energy bond that we love so much to use for energy in ATP doesn't hang out forever. So it's short lived. Um, so if we want to have energy long term, we need to store it in a stable form. Those stable forms are glycogen or lipids. Okay. So how do we make lipids? We make lipids through lipid synthesis, otherwise known as lipogenesis. So here is a schematic of lipogenesis, and I want you to realize here, so the citric acid cycle is literally a cycle that goes in a circle. Now here, from acetyl-CoA, I can actually take acetyl-CoA and form fatty acids <clears throat> using ATP and NADH. And I can form fatty acids from there. And then from there, I can add other components, like I could add glycerol to make a glyceride. I can add, um, if I'm adding a phosphate, I can make a phospholipid. If I'm adding a sugar, I can make a glycolipid. Um, and, you know, and so on and so forth. I can make um, my different types of, of molecules there. So, but you can see that it still is connected. This is still the main pathway that we were discussing earlier at the beginning of, of the video. We've got our glycolysis here going from glucose to pyruvic. Uh, pyruvic acid and pyruvate um, are the same thing, by the way. So glucose to pyruvate, pyruvate goes to acetyl-CoA, and then that enters the uh, citric acid cycle. <clears throat> So DNA and RNA are polymers made up of monomers of nucleic acids. And this is just showing you how those come together. Okay, so this would be an anabolic reaction, combining the nucleic acids together and forming the phosphodiester bond. And phospho, because here is the phosphate. So phosphodiester bond. And in case you forgot, DNA is the genetic material of the cells. It determines inherited features of the organism. It's the master code for protein assembly, while RNA plays the active role in manufacturing of the protein. <clears throat> when we form a peptide, this is another uh, dehydration synthesis reaction or condensation synthesis reaction. So we're taking out water, okay? So water is gonna be a byproduct, okay? So we take that out, we build the peptide bond, and water is a byproduct, okay? Carbohydrates, so carbohydrates are made up of just uh, three elements, C, H, and O, so carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And the ratio is always the same. <clears throat> it's always going to be CHO with twice as much H as the CNO. 
Now, um, carbohydrates are good for short-term energy storage. Um, fats are better for the really long-term storage. Um, if we have a monosaccharide, monosaccharides are also known as simple sugars. Simple sugars can also are also known as the disaccharides because this has like sucrose, which is like kind of like our table sugar that we use. Um, polysaccharides are considered the complex carbohydrates. So how do carbohydrates uh, polymerize? How do those um, how do those mono monomers come together to form the polymer. So here we have our synthesis reaction again. Oops. We have our synthesis reaction and the synthesis reaction is going to be the same thing, a condensation reaction or a dehydration reaction <clears throat> because we have the loss of water. And if we're going the other way, it's going to be a hydro, um, a hydrolysis or hydrolysis. Okay, so lysis means to cut, hydro means to cut with water, so hydrolysis, to cut with water. We can also call that a de uh, decomposition reaction because you're breaking the bond and breaking it down. And this is just another schematic that I made that I thought was pretty, so I put it up. Okay. And if you put glucose and fructose together is how you make um, like our table sugar, which is sucrose. And sucrose, like if you go to the store and you buy a bag of sugar, um, like white bleached sugar, not the pure sugar, then this is what you would get. You would get sucrose. Okay. Uh, glycogen is a very long chain of, of sugar. Okay. <clears throat> and this is a good energy storage. Um, so it is a polymer of sugar. And it is just made up of a string of glucose, and it can be uh, branching here. So, okay. <clears throat> All right. So, what about other other types of catabolism? All right. So, let's continue to talk about some of these alternate. Um, alternate forms. All right, so we have um, <clears throat> talked at the beginning about cellular respiration. Let's talk about some of the variances that we see. So bacteria can capture energy and store it in ATP using aerobic respiration, like we went over at the beginning, or anaerobic respiration, which I'll teach to you in a moment, or fermentation. Okay, so <clears throat> this first um, this first block here is is what we went over at the beginning. So here at the beginning we have our glycolysis. Here is our transition reaction. Here is our Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle. And then this is our electron transport chain. And then down here in blurry red, <laughs> you'll see the oxygen is the final electron acceptor. So by definition, this first block is going to be our aerobic cellular respiration. The second block, the one in the middle here. <clears throat> now, the one in the middle here, you'll see we've got our glycolysis. We have our transition reaction. We have our citric acid cycle or Krebs cycle, and we have our electron transport chain. However, at the end here, instead of having oxygen, I have non-oxygen electron acceptors. So I've got carbonate, I've got nitrite, I've got sulfate, but I do not have oxygen. This is anaerobic respiration. Okay, this is anaerobic respiration. <clears throat> now, this third block is fermentation. Okay, now fermentation is also a type of anaerobic respiration. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit more in, in just a moment. So this is also anaerobic 
a re respiration because as you can see, this also does not have oxygen as a final electron acceptor, right? Because that's the definition of aerobic respiration. This is this first block is the only one that has oxygen as its final electron acceptor. If it does not meet that criteria, it must be anaerobic cellular respiration. So these two last blocks are considered um, uh, anaerobic cellular respiration, technically. <clears throat> but um, microbiologists kind of prefer a little bit because <laughs> um, we would never call fermentation. I mean, we would never call this second block fermentation. Um, but it is often that people will call fermentation anaerobic cellular respiration, but you would never call cellular respiration fermentation. So it's just kind of weird. But I think the issue is really the reason why there's that issue is because this true, pure anaerobic cellular respiration has not been around for very long. We did not know this existed um, 15 years ago, you know, so yeah, so it's pretty new. So um, I think that our terminology needs to change because it does make it very confusing for students. And I do understand that. Um, so, um, so you just have to kind of go back to what the definitions are and just make sure you're remembering the definitions and stick to them. So the definition of aerobic cellular respiration is that Oxygen has to be the final electron acceptor, period. Okay. Now, <clears throat> you'll notice carbon dioxide is in all three of these. Do you see this? Okay. Hopefully you remembered at the beginning of, of the lecture, cellular respiration. I didn't put aerobic or, or anaerobic at the beginning. Okay. Cellular respiration in general is defined by taking an organic um, an organic molecule, usually carbohydrate, but it doesn't have to be carbohydrate, and oxidizing it completely into usually carbon dioxide and water. And believe it or not, all three of these blocks will meet that criteria. Okay, so it's a very broad, open definition that does meet the criteria for all of these new metabolic pathways that are continuously being discovered. All right, now, <clears throat> the definition for anaerobic cellular respiration is that the final electron acceptor is not oxygen. So. There you have it. <laughs> but um, if it is fermentation, then the final electron acceptor is an organic molecule, such as pyruvate or acetaldehyde. Yeah, so it's weird, but it is what it is. All right, so overview of catabolism. <clears throat> so um, so let's talk a little bit more about these um, alternate energy sources that we have. So, um, so this is the one that we started with. Okay, so just to get you kind of familiarized with this um, this new figure that I'm going to be using. Okay, so we have so it's a, a little bit bigger than just the normal cellular respiration because we're actually going to start with the larger polysaccharide. Okay, so we've got our polysaccharide that is ingested, gets broken down into its monosaccharide form. Um, it gets converted, if it's not already glucose, it will get converted into glucose and then enter glycolysis, transition, reaction, citric acid cycle, electron transport chain. Okay, so that is the entire catabolism pathway for carbohydrates. What about fats? <clears throat> so let's talk about fats for a moment. So fats are good energy sources, okay? They have a lot of hydrocarbon bonds. They store enormous amounts of energy. Um, 
the fatty acid chains are actually separated from the glycerol. Okay, so I've got my fats. So fatty acid chains are going to be separated from the glycerol. So we see that at the beginning of our catabolic pathway here. Now, <clears throat> um, now the um, the fatty acids are broken down through uh, beta oxidation, and the um, the glycerol is converted to acetyl CoA. And then after that, it just continues to go through the um, it just continues to go through the pathway of cellular respiration. The resulting products of lipid catabolism are glycerol and the fatty acids can for further be degraded. Glycerol can easily be converted to a form that continues through glycolysis. And um, the released fatty acids are catabolized in a process called uh, beta oxidation. So we've got beta oxidation here. <clears throat> How about proteins? So what do the proteins do? So proteins are used for energy as a last resort. So it will use uh, carbs first, fats as a second choice, and proteins are a last ditch effort. So proteins will be degraded through a bunch of different protease enzymes that are that are hanging out. Okay. Um, extracellular proteases are going to cut proteins at specific amino acid sequences and break them down into smaller peptides. Those smaller peptides can then be um, uh, can then be broken down further. So the polypeptides can then be broken down further into indivi in individual individual amino acids by in um, by additional intracellular proteases. Okay, each each amino acid can be enzymatically deaminated to remove the amino group. Okay, and so here is the deamination. Um, the remaining molecule can then enter the transition cycle or the uh, transition reaction, or I can go directly into the Krebs cycle. Proteins. So proteins are polymers of, <clears throat> um, proteins are polymers of the amino acids, and they are joined by those peptide bonds, and here's where that pepto peptide bond is formed. All right, ATP. Okay, so ATP is um, adenosine triphosphate. And it is the cellular energy currency for all cells, allowing for the coupling of energy requiring anabolic reactions and energy releasing catabolic reactions in cells. It is made in the cell membrane of prokaryotic cells and mitochondria of eukaryotic cells. So energy is in the form of ATP and it is required for metabolism. So energy taken up by the cell in the form of nutrients or sunlight must be converted or metabolized into a usable form. The usable form is <clears throat> the usable form is ATP. ATP is a high energy transfer compound that has the ability to store potential energy in its chemical bonds. The potential energy found in ATP comes from the breakdown of nutrients or by trapping of sunlight energy in photosynthesis. For example, the catabolic reactions that break down glucose generate ATP. ATP is adenine triphosphate. The bond that we are most interested in <clears throat> is the bond that links the second and third phosphate groups together. This bond holds a lot of potential energy. It is a high energy bond. When the energy is needed, this bond can be broken and energy is released. 
When the bond is broken, ATP is broken down to the form ADP and inorganic phosphate. The ATP-ADP um, cycle. So we have our ATP-ADP, sorry, ATP-ADP um, cycle. So this molecule is going to switch back and forth between ADP and ADP. So when that bond breaks, energy gets released, and it will be like an uncharged battery. So adding a phosphate group to a molecule is always going to be called phosphorylation. So ADP waits around until it gets phosphorylated and becomes ATP again. ADP is like an uncharged battery. ATP is like a charged battery. So all organisms make energy through cellular respiration, but they do this differently on if they're depending on if they are anaerobic or aerobic. So cellular respiration is divided into these three steps: glycolysis, the TC or Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain or oxidative phosphorylation. Okay. So just to refresh your memory, aerobic respiration occurs in these three steps. Glycolysis breaks down glucose into two smaller molecules called pyruvate. The Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle is where pyruvate molecules go <clears throat> after it's been converted into acetyl-CoA, just to be specific, um, go to go through a series of reactions to release more electrons. And then the electron transport chain um, are used to create most of the 36 to 38 uh, ATP. Okay. <clears throat> in aerobic respiration, molecular oxygen serves as the terminal acceptor of electrons. This is why the process is called aerobic respiration, meaning with oxygen. Okay, so what happens if it's anaerobic? So anaerobic respiration is a mode of metabolism in which an inorganic molecule other than oxygen as the terminal electron acceptor at the end of the electron transport chain. Okay. So, and notice that I said inorganic because if it's an organic molecule, it's, it's actually going to be fermentation. Okay, so let me just repeat that. If it's an organic molecule, we will call that fermentation, and it will not go through all three of these steps shown here. So anaerobic respiration is a mode of metabolism in which an inorganic molecule other than oxygen serves as the terminal or final electron acceptor at the end of the electron transport chain. Such acceptor compounds include nitrite, sulfate, and uh, uh, fumarate <clears throat> and carbon dioxide for the methane producing bacteria. These bacteria will not grow anaerobically unless a specific chemical component, which serves as the terminal electron acceptor, is added to the medium. Bacteria requiring one of these compounds for anaerobic growth are said to be anaerobic respirers. Bacteria that, that participate in the nitrogen cycle are usually anaerobic respirers. Aerobic cellular respiration is the process in which a compound is oxidized using oxygen as the terminal electron acceptor. Now this is used by humans as well as some prokaryotes. In organisms that have the ability to undergo both aerobic and anaerobic respiration, if oxygen is present, the organism will always use aerobic respiration because it is more efficient, yielding up to 38 ATP molecules. The chemical formula for aerobic respiration shows that glucose and water react to form the products carbon dioxide, water, and ATP. This type of respiration produces 36 ATP molecules from one glucose molecule. 
Many bacteria lack the enzymes needed to undergo the type of glycolysis that humans undergo. They use an alternative form of glycolysis. There are many more, but we'll only, uh, um, we'll only talk about three main types of glycolysis. The EMP, the, e, <clears throat> the EMP glycolysis pathway, the ED pathway, and the PP pathway. <laughs> okay, so I'm so immature. <laughs> okay, so the uh, EMB pathway, you probably didn't know it, but you already know the EMB pathway. This is the glycolysis um, that you learned in high school and also that I reviewed at the beginning of the video. So this is the one that we use as humans. This is the one that mammals use. And this is um, my, again, very simplified version of glycolysis. <clears throat> now, this is, the, uh, this is the ED pathway of glycolysis or the Entner-Dordorov pathway. I think I'll stick with the ED pathway. <clears throat> so when we refer to glycolysis, unless stated otherwise, you can just uh, assume that we mean the EMP pathway. Um, but the ED pathway is only in some prokaryotes, not even in all prokaryotes. So where can we find this? We find the ED pathway um, in bacteria such as the Pseudomonas um, aeruginosa, um, also, uh, E. coli are interesting because they have the ability to undergo either the ED pathway or the EMP pathway, which is kind of interesting. The ED glycolysis actually creates, um, this still creates two pyruvate molecules from glucose, just like the EMP pathway does, but it has a net yield of only one ATP for every one glucose molecule. Um, it also generates one NADH and one NADPH. So let's just do a quick side-by-side -side comparison between the EMB pathway and the ED pathway. So the EDP, ED pathway has a net yield of one ATP and one NADH and one NADPH versus the EMB glycolytic pathway has a net yield of two ATP, two NADH, and that's it. So you actually get more ATP with the EMB pathway. Okay. And my favorite, the PP pathway. It's hard to say that without laughing. Okay, so the PP pathway or pentose phosphate pathway, <clears throat> if I wanted to try not to laugh. This pathway can operate in the presence or absence of oxygen. And this, um, this pathway is something that can be activated in every cell, in every organism. So it's a, glyco a glycolytic pathway that can occur in all cells whenever building materials are needed. So if our bodies need to, um, need to reconstruct a part of a damaged cell and they're finding that they don't have the building materials necessary, then the pentose phosphate pathway will become activated. Now in the schematic that I have here, <clears throat> Um, this uh, first group here, this is actually the cellular respiration, the normal pathway that, that I talked about at the beginning. So we, it starts with our glycolysis. Um, and then a glucose 6-phosphate is an intermediate in the glycolysis pathway. <clears throat> now, um, now, glucose 6-phosphate uh, um, that intermediate that is produced during glycolysis is actually going to branch off and go through the PP pathway. Now, during the PP pathway, um, you will end up with um, you will end up with ribose 5 phosphate and one water molecule, two NADPH, um, which is an electron carrier, and one 
carbon dioxide molecule. So the pentose phosphate pathway is going to create building blocks for amino acids and nucleotides. Uh, this form of glycolysis will take place in the cell whenever amino acids and nucleotides are needed to form new proteins and new nucleic acids, respectively, for DNA or RNA. Now, the pentose phosphate pathway takes place in the cytosol of the cell, or you could say cytoplasm, that would be fine too. Um, the pentose phosphate pathway takes place in the cytosol or cytoplasm of the cell, uh, which is the same location as uh, the other types of glycolysis would take place. The two most important products from this process are the ribose 5-phosphate sugar, which is used to make DNA and RNA, um, but it also makes NADPH, which the NADPH is going to help with building other additional building blocks, which will go on to build other macromolecules. So, all right. <clears throat> Now, fermentation is a type of anaerobic respiration, but that is not always what we are referring to. So true anaerobic respiration will go through all of the steps of glycolysis, the TCA cycle or a similar cycle to TCA that's just modified, and an electron transport, transport chain. Uh, the enzymes and substrates might look a little bit different, though. Um, the thing that defines anaerobic respiration is that the final electron acceptor will be something besides oxygen. For example, uh, let's look at methanogens. So anaerobic respiration is another mode of metabolism in which the specific compound other than oxygen serves as the terminal or final electron acceptor. Such acceptor compounds include um, nitrate, <clears throat> nitrite, sulfate, fumarate, and carbon dioxide for your methane producing bacteria like we have here. So, <clears throat> um, I've already read this slide, didn't I? Um, I certainly did. Okay. Now, what's kind of interesting is if you look at these, um, if you look at these alternates, these um, other alternates are actually pretty close to oxygen, which is kind of interesting. So, um, so it's not too much of a stretch of the imagination that these other compounds would be used in a similar fashion in, um, in other similar metabolic pathways in other organisms. <clears throat> so, um, in both aerobic and anaerobic respiration, the end goal is still the same, to make ATP by oxidative phosphorylation, um, which produces ATP by generating a proton motive force that can be used by the ATP synthase to make ATP. In aerobic respiration, we use something besides oxygen as the final electron acceptor. Boy, I've said that a lot, so yeah, that's really going to be on your mind. Okay. Now, um, another important group of anaerobic respirers are our nitrate respirers. This is a large group of anaerobic respirers, and <clears throat> they, uh, these nitrate reducers are going to use nitrate, uh, nitrite actually, as the final electron acceptor. Don't worry about the specifics, but I thought this was kind of cool. So this is actually the electron transport chain for E. coli during the process of anaerobic respiration. This is another schematic for the um, anaerobic bacterial metabolism of uh, nitrate uh, respiration. So, but you don't have to worry about all these little things, but just thought it was kind of cool. Thought you might be interested. So. The, this electron transport chain um, also does have different enzymes than we see in the um, electron transport chain that we looked at earlier. Um, different species can process uh, the nitrate into different end products. Um, the generation of the proton motive force that can be used to, um, to use 
by the ATP synthase is still the same. So the general concept is always still the same. <clears throat> now, our sulfate reducers um, are another group of our anaerobic respirers. And here you're going to have some type of sulfur or sulfurous compound is going to be used as the replacement for oxygen as the final electron acceptor. And here is a schematic of what, um, what their electron transport chain looks like. Very, very different. Um, so most of the cells here actually will use pyruvate, lactate, or hydrogen as their electron donor to the, um, uh, to the electron transport chain. <clears throat> um, so it, that's supposed to say in contrast, not in contract. <laughs> in contrast, NADH and FADH2 is used in aerobic cellular respiration. So yeah, so the electron carriers are very, very different in sulfate respiration, which is kind of interesting. Um, in methanogenesis, so methanogenesis, these are our, um, our uh, anaerobic bacteria and our, our archaea, <clears throat> sorry, our archaea that are our methane producers, um, like the ones that um, exist in the rumen of cows, for example. Um, so methanogenesis is the biological production of, meth of methane. This is a byproduct of the microbial metabolism for these uh, methanogens. And um, one of the archaea that undergoes methanogenesis is uh, methanococcus. I guess it's aptly named, right? So methanogens uh, metabolize by reducing carbon dioxide, and I have the equation here. They reduce carbon dioxide to methane, and they do this by using electrons uh, from hydrogen gas. Okay. <clears throat> And um, we have a lot of bacteria which are really important to the nitrogen cycle. Um, we have uh, bacteria which are involved with actually each of these uh, phases. So you've got your nitrogen fixing bacteria, your nitri uh, nitrifying bacteria, and your denitrification bacteria. So bacteria are important for every phase of the nitrogen cycle. So denitrification is the utilization of nitrate, which is uh, um, NO negative <clears> three, <throat> and um, as a terminal electron acceptor. So this is when, um, when it is going through the anaerobic cellular respiration process and using nitrate as the terminal electron acceptor. It is a widespread process that is used by many members of our proteobacteria. Okay, so our phylum, the proteobacteria, um, use this. This is important for nitrogen cycling, and it's also used for wastewater treatment. So what is the nitrogen cycle? So the nitrogen cycle consists of a recycling process by which organic and inorganic nitrogen compounds are used metabolically and recycled among bacteria, plants, and animals. Important processes include ammonification, mineralization, nitrification, denitrification, and nitrogen fixation. And all of these are carried out primarily by bacteria. Let's look at our sulfate reducers. Our sulfate reducing bacteria. Sulfate reduction is used by many gram negative bacteria. And um, these gram negative bacteria are found in the delta proteobacteria <clears throat> group, such as the desulfo. Uh, to maculum, desulfotomaculatum. Eh, I can't say that. Desulfotomaculum. There, that's a little bit better. Or the archaea, um, or the archaean, archaeoglobus. Hydrogen sulfide is produced as a metabolic end product. For sulfate reduction, electron donors and energy is needed. Okay, 
So enzymes are needed to, catal um, to catalyze all of these different reactions. <clears throat> and how a lot of these are done is through what we call the uh, lock and key synthesis model. So enzymes are specific to the reaction that it catalyzes. And in the lock and key synthesis model, the enzyme interacts with the substrate specifically in this lock and key sort of fashion. So the shape of the substrates fit perfectly and very specifically into the active sites of the enzymes, um, like a lock and a key. In biology, we see this pattern of uh, fitting shapes together, um, and we call this um, the complementary fit. So properties of enzymes. Um, enzymes are reusable. They are highly specific. Um, they have an active site. Um, they are usually proteins, and you can always recognize an enzyme just by its name because it will end with ASE. It will end in ACE. So um, here's some example of enzyme names. So they'll always end with ACE, <clears throat> and the beginning of their name will always have something to do with their function, either what it does or what it um, what it acts on. Um, for example, if it um, um, if it transfers something, then it might be a transferase. If it cuts with water, maybe it's a hyd um, hydrolase. <clears throat> Um, if it brings things together, uh, glues things together, maybe it's a ligase. So there are a few things that do affect the function of enzymes. Now, um, without our metabolic processes, um, we die. And this is true for all organisms. So if you have an organism that, um, that you can kill its enzyme function, you have killed the organism. So um, all of the metabolic functions, all those different steps and reactions of the process, almost all of them, need specific enzymes for each of those. So if you were to kill an enzyme <clears throat> or kill those enzymes, you would kill the um, you would kill the individual organism as well, which is one of the reasons why we care about this. So, um, so this slide is particular to amylase, which is found in saliva and humans. So um, that's why this says enzymes work best around body temperature of humans, which is 37 degrees Celsius. However, if we're looking at an enzyme in an organism that is um you know that is a a psychrophile and loves it at you know 10 degrees celsius which would be way too cold for me um you know then i'm sure that the enzymes will have an optimal temperature that is much much lower than that so whatever the optimal temperature of that organism is is going to be right around what the optimal temperature for that enzyme so, I mean, it just makes, it just makes sense. So it's, it has evolved that way for a reason and, um, it's going to be its optimal, uh, its optimal function. <clears throat> All right. So, um, All right, so the important thing here is if you really look at this, you can also, um, you can relate this to what we really see with organisms too, with microbes. When you get a microbe really cold, you usually don't kill it. You just put it into like a state of hibernation, right? So, which makes sense because if you look at what happens to the enzymes of that organism, the enzy enzymes are not degraded, they're not destroyed, they're just slowed down, okay? So when I get, so for example, 
when I put something in the freezer, um, I have slowed down its decaying process, right? So I've slowed down the growth of whatever bacteria um, might be rotting my food by putting it in a cold environment. Okay. Now, <clears throat> if I want to kill bacteria, if I want to kill bacteria, then what I need to do is I need to heat it. Um, now, of course, if it's an endospore, they're resistant to heat, so I'm going to have to really heat it, right? 121 degrees Celsius, right, um, with moist heat in an autoclave. So with 15 minutes, right, 15 to 20 minutes. So it's a lot. <clears throat> um, but what happens with heat Depending on the organism and depending on the enzyme, if I can heat it hot enough, then I degrade the enzyme. And because it's a protein, once I degrade the enzyme, I've killed that tertiary structure, it's not coming back. So I've essentially killed the enzyme and killed the creature. So this is one of the reasons why we talk about... Um, the function of enzymes and what they are sensitive to because it is very relevant. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So fermentation. Now fermentation um, is uh, fermentation is essentially the same process as glycolysis except instead of making two pyruvate molecules from glucose, the final product is not pyruvate. Then what is it? So depends on the type of fermentation going on. So let's see what that is. <clears throat> so, so fermentation um, does not go through um, the citric acid cycle or the electron transport chain. <clears throat> okay, so glycolysis, it does go through glycolysis. And remember glycolysis does not need oxygen. Okay, it's an anaerobic process. <clears throat> so we go through glycolysis and then straight to fermentation of whatever type of fermentation it is. Okay, <clears throat> so fermentation does not produce any ATP on its own. It, it only produces, um, I mean, it itself does not produce anything. <laughs> so the ATP that is produced is just produced in glycolysis. So... Um, yeah, and that glycolysis produces the two ATP that it would have normally. All right, so fermentation, what does it require? So in fermentation, the definition of fermentation is when it has an organic compound as a terminal electron acceptor. Um, and usually that might be pyruvate, for example, as um, an electron acceptor. So in fermentations, um, the simple organic end product um, is formed by the anaerobic dissimilation, or taking apart, <clears throat> of glucose or another similar compound, usually a carbohydrate. Um, on reduction, these organic end products are actually secreted into the medium as waste products, as either alcohols or acids. So let's compare and contrast uh, between the differences of anaerobic cellular respiration and fermentation. Okay. So anaerobic cellular respiration. So cellular respiration uses two different molecules for the electron donor and the electron acceptor, okay? Whereas fermentation uses the same molecule as the electron donor and the electron um, acceptor, okay? So all the redox transformations act on atoms found in the initial substrate. <clears throat> all right, anaerobic cellular respiration. Most of the ATP is generated using oxidative phosphorylation. Okay, that's in the electron transport chain. In fermentation, fermentation only uses substrate level phosphorylation, which is during glycolysis, to synthesize ATP. Okay, and we've seen this once before, but now that we've actually talked about all three 
of these different pathways. Let's look at them again. Okay. So um, there's a wide variance, especially especially with this middle one here, where it says maximum ATP produced is anywhere between two and 36 molecules, right? There's a huge variance here. Um, <clears throat> yeah, big difference. Fermentation, two, um, two max. <clears throat> um, true anaerobic respiration just depends. Anywhere from two to 36, it's all over the place. Um, with uh, aerobic cellular respiration, a maximum of 38 um, <clears throat> on its best day. Okay. So some prokaryotes are facultative um, aerobes, meaning that they do have the necessary genes um, and enzymes uh, necessary to carry out aerobic cellular respiration as long as oxygen is present to be the final electron acceptor in the process. Facultative anaerobes will use aerobic cellular respiration whenever possible because it yields so much more ATP in most cases. Um, so if I just look at glycolysis and cellular respiration versus glycolysis and fermentation, um, there's a big difference. You know, you're looking at 2 ATP versus 36 ATP. So... So let's look at lactic acid fermentation. <clears throat> so during lactic acid fermentation, cells use a molecule called NADH to transfer electrons, I'm sorry, to take electrons from the glucose molecule. The NADH will, um, sorry, the NADH uses the energy stored in the electrons to make ATP and converts glucose to pyruvate. This process is called glycolysis and is the first step in all forms of cellular respiration. In lactic acid fermentation, the next step is to <clears throat> convert pyruvate to lactic acid. Lactic acid, although a waste product for bacteria, can be used to make human foods like yogurt. Fermentation is most often triggered by a lack of sufficient oxygen to continue running aerobic respiration. For example, humans undergo lactic acid fermentation. Um, instead of finishing with pyruvate, lactic acid is created, created instead inside of the muscles. Um, long distance runners are familiar with lactic acid. It can build up in the muscles and cause cramping. Another thing to note, too, is that um, in glycolysis, NAD actually gets, um, I'm sorry, in fermentation. In fermentation, we get a replenishment of the NAD plus molecule, <clears throat> which is really important to keep that going. Lactic acid bacteria are really important for um, making yogurts and uh, cheeses, for example. <clears throat> um, so bacteria of several gram-positive genera, including uh, lactobacillus and leuconostoc and streptococcus, are collectively known as lactic acid bacteria. And various strains are important in food production. So during yogurt and cheese production, the highly acidic environment generated by the lactic acid fermentation acts to denature the proteins contained in milk, which causes it to solidify. In ethanol fermentation or alcoholic fermentation, um, the NADH takes electrons from the glucose molecule and turns it into pyruvate during glycolysis. From here, the pyruvate is converted into ethanol instead of lactic acid. This is the same ethanol that we find in beverages like wine and beer. Alcoholic fermentation also makes carbon dioxide, which gives the beer its carbonation. 
fermentation recycles that NAD molecule <clears throat> for glycolysis. So if it were not for the fermentation pathways, then we would not have the NAD, uh, the NAD molecule to be recycled here for the glycolysis. So no ATP would be harvested from the breakdown of glucose. So it's important to have these pathways. So alcoholic fermentation, what occurs here? So in the first reaction, the enzyme pyruvate, <clears throat> the enzyme pyruvate decarboxylase removes the carboxyl group from pyruvate, releasing carbon dioxide gas while producing the two carbon molecule acetaldehyde. The second reaction transfers an electron from NADH to acetaldehyde, producing ethanol and NAD+. The ethanol fermentation of pyruvate by the yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae is used in the production of alcoholic beverages. The yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae also produces bread products, bread products, <clears throat> makes bread products rise due to its carbon dioxide production. Ethanol fermentation can also be used in biofuel production. And here is the equation for alcoholic fermentation below. Okay. And there's even heterolactic or mixed fermentation. Some bacteria perform heterolactic fermentation, which involves producing a mixture of lactic acid, ethanol, and or even acetic acid and carbon dioxide as a result. The reason that these organisms are able to do this is because they actually use the pentose phosphate pathway instead of the EMP pathway for their glycolysis. So we can see here that we're going to get all sorts of things. We see succinate, we see um, lactate, formate, um, ethanol, and acetate. <clears throat> so um, here's some of the important um, bacterial fermentation pathways that you should know. So we've got glucose um, generating 2 ATP during glycolysis and producing pyruvate. And then here are some, uh, some bacteria and some of their end products that they produce during their individual types of fermentation. So lactobacillus and streptococcus are your um, lactic acid bacteria, and they're going to form lactic acid fermentation. Um, your Saccharomyces cerevisiae is going to perform your alcoholic or ethanol fermentation. Uh, e. coli or Escherichia <clears throat> uh, coli um, is going to create acidic end products along with carbon dioxide. Uh, enterobacteria is going to um, create um, neutral end products. Uh, propanoic acid and acetic acid is going to be created by propion, uh, propiony bacterium, and clostridium is going to produce uh, butyric acid, butanol, and acetone. All right, so here's uh, another great graph that I was able to find <clears throat> that shows different types of metabolism and, um, and different maximum yields. So um, here we see the different types of uh, glycolysis and fermentation pathways and electron transport chain. So let's just uh, take a look at this. So types of metabolism. So let's first look at a microorganism called the Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Um, that undergoes um, aerobic metabolism. So this aerobic metabolizer uses oxygen, as it should for an aerobic metabolizer, <laughs> aerobic res respirer, I should say. <clears throat> it uses the EMP glycolytic pathway. It uses the Krebs cycle, and then it uses the electron transport chain, and it yields the maximum 38 uh, ATP molecules. Um, here we have the anaerobic respirers. Um, 
the Paracoccus and the uh, the Paracoccus denitrificans, which uses um, these inorganic molecules as electron acceptors, and it is going to um, be able to produce between 5 and 36 molecules of ATP, depending on what uh, final electron acceptor is available at the time, interestingly. Um, fermentation, <clears throat> as it's being done by Candida albicans, um, will use an organic product such as pyruvate, um, as its final electron acceptor. So it is a fermenter and it is going to undergo the glycolysis process, the EMP version of the glycolysis process, followed by fermentation to yield only a measly 2 ATP. Okay, so organisms carrying out fermentation called fermenters produce a maximum of only ATP molecules per glucose during glycolysis. So the t this table compares the final electron acceptors and methods of ATP syn synthesis in aerobic respirers, anaerobic respiration, and fermentation. Propionoic acid fermentation is um, is actually really cool because we can use we actually use it for Swiss cheese. It gives Swiss cheese that really distinct flavor that Swiss cheese has. Um, also, fermentation can give us uh, things like acetone, which we use for um, for nail polish remover, for example. <clears throat> we also get other products like butanol, which is another industrial solvent. Um, um, we can also get things like uh, pharmaceutical compounds, um, antibiotics, even vaccines and vitamins through things like mixed acid uh, ferma uh, fermenta uh, fermentation. <clears throat> um, we also can use um, fermentation products for lab and diagnostic use. For example, fermentation products are used in the laboratory to be able to differentiate different types of bacteria from one another. Um, e. coli can ferment lactose and um, they form gas, whereas some of its close gram negative relatives cannot. So that's a good test that can be used in the lab to distinguish it. The ability to ferment sugar um, uh, sugar al alcohol sorbitol is used to identify the pathogenic enterohemorrhagic uh, strain of E. coli because unlike other E. coli strains, it is unable to ferment sorbitol. So that's very important. You know, you want to know if you have that pathogenic version of E. coli. And if it is unable to ferment sorbitol, then you know you might have that uh, pathogenic version of E. coli. So wonderful laboratory test that you can do to exploit that metabolic fact of that organism. Um, mannitol fermentation um, is going to be able to differentiate the uh, mannitol fermenting properties of Staphylococcus aureus from non-mannitol fermenting Staphylococci. So, um, it's really good to be able to recognize one from the other. Um, so here are some of the, uh, uh, just another way to look at the common, um, common pathways. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> so. In order for metabolism to occur, you really need three things. You have to have a source of carbon, you have to have a source of energy, you have to have a source of electrons. So the six most common elements that we need to have is carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. <clears throat> All right. So how do we, we can actually uh, categorize organisms based on what they use as carbon sources, what they use as energy sources. So I'll just give you just a couple of those um, uh, things real quickly. 
<clears throat> so we can categorize organisms based on how they obtain carbon from the environment. So organisms uh, can be categorized either as autotrophic or heterotrophic based on how they obtain their carbon. So when we look at microbial metabolic diversity, um, here are some uh, categorizations based on carbon sources. So we start here at the top of our table and it says microorganism metabolism. So if they are able to use carb, oops, if they use carbon dioxide as a carbon source, then we can call them an autotroph. When we say autotroph, um, autotroph means that they literally auto means uh, self and troph means to eat. So the literal translation means to eat self, which is kind of weird. So it doesn't really mean that it's eating itself, what it means is that it's self-sufficient, that it doesn't have to consume another organism. So in other words, it's self-sufficient. It doesn't have to consume another organism versus heterotroph means eat other or eat another. So yeah, so one doesn't have to eat anybody else. The heterotroph does. So we are heterotrophic. We have to eat other things in order to survive. <clears throat> Whereas a plant doesn't really have to eat anybody. So unless it's a Venus flytrap or something like that. <laughs> so, okay. So the categorizations, um, so you just always have to go back to the pure definition. Okay. So if it uses carbon dioxide as a carbon source, then it would be categorized as an autotroph, as an autotroph. Okay. <clears throat> All right, if it uses an organic compound as a carbon source, it is a heterotroph, okay? So when we say uses organic compounds, specifically what we are referring to is lipid, carbohydrate, protein, that's it, okay? An organic compound is a lipid, carbohydrate, protein always. So that's what we mean by organic compound. All right. <clears throat> so uh, let's go ahead and let, let's do the heterotroph side first. So we're going to go ahead and continue down the heterotroph side. So we're going to go down heterotroph and we see, um, we see now it's going to split off into organic compounds and light. Okay. So some organisms are able to use organic compounds as a carbon source, okay? So if it can use an organic compound as a carbon source, but it needs to use, uh, and it needs to use an organic compound as an energy source, then it would be a chemoheterotroph, a chemoheterotroph, okay? Chemo in this sense, comes from the organic compounds here. Okay, so what what does this mean? All right, so we see um, uh, feeding on living organic matter, living on dead organic matter. That sounds great. <laughs> so yeah, so eating the living and eating the dead. That sounds wonderful. But <clears throat> will you get me a chocolate? <laughs> um, and then let's see. Um, okay. And then if it's able to, um, if it's able to use a carbon, um, an organic compound as a carbon source, but light as an energy source, then we call it a photoheterotroph. Um, examples of this would be green and purple non-sulfur bacteria. So they do that. <clears throat> All right, so let's go the other side. Um, so using carbon dioxide as a carbon source, these are our autotrophs, okay? So autotrophs and using carbon dioxide as a, um, um, as a carbon source, using light as an energy source, we get our photo autotrophs. So the auto part comes from the 
carbon dioxide carbon source. The photo part comes from the light as the energy source. Okay. Now we will continue down. And now we're going to have the ones that use water and the ones that don't use water. Okay. That use water carry out and the ones that don't use water carry out. And we get our oxygenic and our anoxygenic. So some make oxygen and some don't during the process. Okay. The ones that do make oxygen, those are cyanobacteria that changed our atmosphere, right? And algae, which are eukaryotic. Algae are eukaryotic, cyanobacteria are prokaryotic. Okay. Now, um, <clears throat> our anoxygenic photosynthesizers would be green and purple bacteria, for example. Now, what if I go the other way? <clears throat> so um, we have organisms, microorganisms, that use uh, carbon dioxide as a carbon source. And then they can use inorganic compounds. Okay, These are chemoautotrophs. And this can include some bacteria and some archaea. So really, it's like, boy, anything goes. Um, we could also reorganize the table in another way to categorize based on uh, the energy source first. <clears throat> and if we did that, then it would look like this. So we have uh, energy source. So if it's chemical, okay, and that would include, um, you know, food, like having to eat versus I can't eat sunlight and live for long. <clears throat> so you have your phototrophs, photo meaning light. So eat light. Okay, so this is our light eaters. Okay, versus chemical. Well, we need chemical energy. So we actually have to ingest things that have molecules that we can break down and metabolize, right? So we have our chemotrophs and our phototrophs. All right, now. And then after that, then we can go ahead and separate in, it into its individual carbon sources. So we have our chemoheterotrophs, and depending on its final electron acceptor, if it uses oxygen versus if it does not use oxygen. So if it's anaerobic, it would be here. Okay. So, but it could be um, it could be anaerobic. <clears throat> but it could use an organic compound. Okay, so if it's anaerobic and it uses an organic compound, these are going to be our fermenters. All right, these are our fermenters. They're going to undergo fermentation. Okay. However, <clears throat> if they are here, then that means um, that they are going to undergo anaerobic cellular respiration, not fermentation. Okay, anaerobic cellular respiration that is not fermentation. All right. Versus, we could go this way too. You've got your chemoheterotroph. So this is where we would be here on this on this map. So organic compounds, we have to consume them. Um, and our final electron acceptor is oxygen, and we would be here. All right, let's look at the other side. So we've got our, um, our <clears throat> photosynthetic organisms that eat light. <laughs> All right, so <clears throat> as an energy source, they are going to take in light, but they still need their carbon source, right? So, um, <clears throat> So some can use uh, carbon dioxide as their carbon source. Those would be your photoautotrophs, photoautotrophs. And some are going to use water to reduce carbon dioxide. If it does, it's called oxygenic because it's actually going to create oxygen. If it does not use water to reduce carbon dioxide, it does not produce oxygen. And on the other side, we've got organic compounds as the carbon source. So our organic compounds <clears throat> are needed for our photoheterotrophs. <clears throat> and these examples of this would be green non-sulfurous bacteria and purple non-sulfur bacteria.
Okay. So there are four main classes of organisms based on what they use as a source of carbon and what they can metabolize for energy. Okay. So when we say photoautotroph, photoautotroph means that the carbon source is carbon dioxide, okay, and the energy source is sunlight. Okay. <clears throat> Chemoautotroph. Um, chemo means, uh, sorry, so the carbon source is carbon dioxide and the energy source is organic molecules. The photoheterotroph is carbon source is organic molecules and the energy source is sunlight. The chemoheterotroph is carb the carbon source is organic molecules. And the energy source is also organic molecules. Okay, so I think this is uh, more of the same here. <clears throat> so I think the best way to do this is just to, you know, break it down into its carbon source and its energy source, right? So. <clears throat> so first of all, you just want to look at is um, the best way to understand its classifications based on energy and carbon sources is just to simply break down the word. For example, each of these terms begins with either photo or chemo. So here's the rule. For the first word is going to define the energy source for that class of organism. Photo means light. This means the organism classified as photoautotrophs or photoheterotrophs will use sunlight or packets of energy called photons as their energy source. The word chemo means chemical, but for our purposes, I like to think of chemo as specifically organic chemical compounds. This means organisms classified as chemoautotrophs or chemoheterotrophs will use organic chemical compounds as their energy source. Organic chemical compounds mean proteins, lipids, and carbohydrates. Next, we can look at the second word. The second word sits <clears throat> somewhat in the middle of these classifications. Each of these terms is either auto or hetero in it. So here's the rule. The first word is going to define the energy source for that class of organisms. The second is going to define the carbon source for that class of organisms. The word auto means self. These are autotrophs that we know to, to make their own food. They do not need to consume organic matter like heterotrophs do. <clears throat> this means that organisms classified as photoautotrophs and chemoautotrophs will use the inorganic chemical compound carbon dioxide as their carbon source. All right, so here comes your carbon dioxide or your autotrophs. Okay, now the word hetero means other. These are heterotrophs, which means eat other. These are organisms that must consume organic matter in order to live. This means that organisms classified as photoheterotrophs or chemoheterotrophs must consume organic mo molecules to use as their carbon source. Organic molecules include proteins, lipids, and carbohydrates. All right, so I think that, that is plenty to keep you entertained. Good luck studying and uh, see you soon.